Today on Cyberwork, my guest is Christina Van Houten of Mimecast and the creator of the Women at Work website. We'll discuss tactics for bringing more women and diverse candidates into cybersecurity, the importance of a well-balanced and skills-diverse team, and how the work of Chief Strategy Officer is like an ever-evolving game of Tetris. That's all today on Cyberwork. Also, let's talk about Cyberwork Applied, a new series from Cyberwork. Tune in as expert InfoSec instructors and industry practitioners teach you a new cybersecurity skill and then show you how that skill applies to real world scenarios. You'll learn how to carry out a variety of cyber attacks, practice using common cybersecurity tools, engage with walkthroughs that explain how major breaches occurred and more. And believe it or not, it's all free. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash learn or click the link in the description below and get started with hands-on training in a fun environment while keeping the cybersecurity skills you have relevant. That's infosecinstitute.com slash learn, infosecinstitute.com slash learn. And now let's begin the show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Christina Van Houten is a veteran of the enterprise technology industry, having spent two decades with some of the world's largest firms, including Oracle, IBM, and Infor Global Solutions, as well as Neteza and ProfitLogic, the entrepreneurial companies that were acquired by them. Currently, Christina is Chief Strategy Officer for Mimecast, a global leader in cybersecurity, where she leads product management, product strategy, corporate development, and M&A. She also serves on the board of directors for Tech Target and has been involved as an advisory board member of several emerging technology firms. In 2017, Christina launched Women at Work, a resource platform dedicated to the economic advancement and self-reliance of women and girls around the world. All these accomplishments and more are going to be the topics of today's episode. We're going to talk about women in cybersecurity, the Women at Work program, and more strategies to bring a more diverse workforce to our industry. Christine, thank you for joining me today on Cyberwork. Christina, sorry. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited for our conversation. Thank you very much, Christine. I appreciate that. Uh, so I always like to start out, and you've, you've had a, a quite storied career, but how did you first get interested in cybersecurity and computers and tech? You know, your bio straddles a lot of different fields, fields of interest and skill sets. So what was it about cybersecurity that you find interesting or compelling? Yeah, I, I'm sort of a latecomer to cyber. I, I've been in tech okay. for over two decades and uh, just have certainly always had to think about security as owning uh, ERP products, enterprise technology products, infrastructure. But I, I hadn't had a deep domain experience in cyber until Mimecast reached out. And I think what was really interesting about our CEO, Peter Bauer, is he, he realized that there was um, a broader perspective from having been in uh, all different parts of enterprise technology that was, could add a lot of value to cyber and that what the, what the space was about to undergo as it had um, been emerging and lots of different categories pro proliferating and the need for uh, more of a, um, a sweet approach and a more holistic way of thinking about the problem and, and helping organizations solve it in a way that was more consumable um, that, that there was uh, some fresh perspectives from, from outside cyber to bring to that and saw that, that opportunity with me uh, combined with a lot of deep domain cyber that was already in the business. So that's, that's how I've ended up there. And so three years in, um, it, it really has turned out to be that way, uh, that, right. that evolution is kind of fully underway. And I've really enjoyed being able to, to dig in and, and, and become an expert, I guess, in the industry yeah. while also maintaining this uh, broader perspective as well. Can, can we dr drill in a little bit more about what sort of what strategies that cybersecurity in, in this area was lacking that you were able to bring in from like an entrepreneurial or, you know, these other sort of business uh, standpoints, like what were, what was the, what was the synergy? What was the collaboration that, uh, that was missing before? Yeah, I think um, cyber is a, is a really challenging dynamic space. And mm -hmm. so you have these kind of slivers of uh, best of breed capabilities that had been emerging. And, and for the most part that had attracted people who had uh, very acute expertise, you know, and in, in a very discreet part of, of solving the problem. And so it's, 
I, I think um, that that really serves um, an uh, an area of a business well in the early phases of a of a piece of technology emerging mm -hmm. to solve a mm -hmm. problem. Right. Um, but I think over time, it, it just it, there's a lot of Darwinism, you know, in in tech as there is in everything in life, but especially in tech. And so, uh, it I think being able to see connections um, and see how the problem is morphing and see. Uh, where you can you can kind of look outside of of your your particular sphere and and I've seen that in many cases where coming in sometimes I would come in and think well how am I going to add value to this but at, by just asking a few questions I would in many cases see see connections that maybe other people didn't and right. and even the most um, advanced engineer who'd been working on something for a long time would say, oh yeah, we could use this thing to solve this thing as well and, right. and end up with a better, a faster solution, something that's more efficacious and, and also easier to use and more cost effective. So it was, that's, there's been kind of a series of that, that adjacent innovation mm -hmm. uh, pieces of conversation as, as we've been able to bring bring different capabilities um, that we've developed organically um, taking like a nugget of something and apply it to, to doing something else, but also bringing in new, entirely new capabilities through m &A, uh, and and just the catalytic effect that those have injected into the business and also into our technology where um, you really get what we call a sweet multiplier effect by by kind of combining things in a way that um, each becomes better on their own yes. and you're, you're sort of sharing uh, complementary things. And um, so that, that's been a lot of fun. It's like, I don't know, Sudoku or, uh, you know, pick your, <laughs> yeah, you want, pick your you want, favorite crossword. Yeah, like Tetris, or, you feel the, the pieces are falling yes, exactly. perfectly into place. It's very satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right, yep. I love it. So um, let's, I want to talk a little more about your, your career. Can you tell me about some of the major stepping stones in your career? Because you've, you've got some pretty over impressive company names in your background, Oracle, IBM. Uh, so what were some of the accomplishments or successful projects or just aha moments that helped you move up to your next levels of your career? Yeah, it, it it couldn't have been more random or weird or <laughs> meandering. Yeah, I uh, I was a liberal arts under. I, I'm 54, so I graduated college in 1989. Tech mm -hmm. was hardly a thing then. Um, right. I I went to I learned how to type on a manual typewriter in Catholic yep. school from the nuns. I didn't even take a computer to college. I think I owned my first computer in graduate school. Yeah. Um. I I wanted to to do public interest work. I wanted mm -hmm. to do community and economic development and um, low income housing and all, all kinds of, um, and I did a bunch of things that, uh, around all of that in my twenties. And I ended up uh, very randomly um, evolving into a job in tech in, in the late nineties. And frankly, never thought I would be good at it. I just, mm -hmm. I, I think I was intimidated by it. I had not been a STEM girl as you know, somebody might say now. Um, and so I, I sort of fell into it and then very quickly realized that I, I just was something that was very consumable and, and that something that I was very good at, that I was very energized by the problem. Again, back to our Tetris thing, that the problem solving pieces of it, the, right. the opportunity to work with this incredible continuum of personalities, like, and nowhere do you get the diversity of personalities that you do in enterprise technology companies because you get these brilliant extrovert, usually extroverted sales guys and gals who are out there and amazing storytellers and thinkers and engagers. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have these brilliant engineers who are just amazing, quiet leaders, earnest guys who are in gals who are just, I, I just have so much joy in getting to collaborate with them and envision solving something for, for an end user or, um, right you know, a, a whole category of, of problems or verticals. And, and so I, I very quickly um, just dug in and realized that, 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 that was, this was the place for me. And the first, the first um, inflection point back to your original question was mm -hmm. um, I was still feeling my way, but I pretty quickly ended up uh, leading the sale of a $4 million sale of uh, in this emerging pretty small company. It was the first big license deal they ever did with a giant tier one retailer. 
And I thought, and it had been a really difficult sale. It had been um, lots of engagement and, and conversations and design and all that. And, and, I, and then the opportunity to then really dig in and build something pretty advanced. And so that, that was one, that was sort of the first major inflection point. The second was um, I, I ended up having two babies like 18 months apart. This was mm-hmm. my mid to late thirties. Okay. And, and I, and it was at a time where I, I couldn't have been happier in my career and more worried about what is this going to do to that? You know, how, how are these, these babies going to mess all this up? Right. And, um, but I, so coming back and realizing the opportunity to pivot, like the role that I was yeah. in, wasn't the only role that I could add value in and evolve from more of a, um, that role of product management sitting in between the customer in the field and, and the engineering work to actually being much more embedded inside of engineering. And that was such a, a great, at the time I thought, is this, is this going to hurt my career? Cause it was kind of a lateral move or maybe even a, a step back, right. but it, in the end, I think it was one of the most important things I did because mm. it gave, it gave me much more an on the ground technical engineering role. Uh, I ran common components and build engineering. I, a, along with, um, just kind of overall engineering operations and release and launch management and those kinds of things. And so all of that um, and developing a whole detailed product development life cycle. And those were things that have still stuck with me, you know, and it, took, it, it enabled me to, to accommodate my personal life and, and, my, and keep going in my professional life. And I think for women out there realizing that you can make those pivots and yep. if you can show up and think about what the win-win is, you know, if you're gaining those bits of experience, it's very expensive for, for them, for, for employers to lose you. And, yes. and I, they're, they're probably more willing to accommodate you than you think, you yeah. know, if, if you yeah. can brainstorm that. And then the, the last, uh, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, everything has to be in threes. The third, right. I think big moment was, uh, right at, not too long after that, I'd been at this company for five years when Oracle acquired it. And I'd never been acquired like that. And I'd never no. been yeah. part of a company that large, you know, right. and, and I went in assuming that, uh, especially because I had two young babies still, and some one of them was particularly challenging at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought, oh, I just I don't, this isn't going to be for me. But sticking it out, and again, kind of figuring, looking, kind of keeping my head down during all the chaos that ensues after an acquisition, but also keeping my head up and seeing where I could add value and on my own without anyone asking, yep. creating something, sort of seeing who was in charge and uh, who, who I could, who I could help. Um, right. And it, in a world where lots, there were lots of unknowns. And so I dug in and created something, um, a business value for, for who was then the general manager. And from that point, he, he sort of took me, plucked me out of where I was and took me along, not only through five years, I ended up five years at Oracle, but then uh, also my seven year tenure at N4 as well. So hmm. um, there are these moments where I think if you can, especially in sort of that emerging part of your career, be willing to move sideways, be willing to, to take initiative around creating something for someone in the business that no one asks you to do, uh, that you might be uniquely position to do because it's frankly tedious and hard <laughs> and right. or hard yeah. um that that can uh, lead to in moments of inflection that open open new doors and opportunities so let's let's talk about your your current job what do, what is your average work day or work week look like as chief strategy officer at mimecast there's some tasks or projects that you do every week yeah i think the the, the reason i've kind of stayed in this this area of the business from pretty much all of the 22 years is that that area between the people who carry a bag and the people who code is because of the opportunity to, to do such a hugely diverse set of things. And mm-hmm. I think some people really prefer predictability. They want to know yeah. what their role is. They want to know what's expected of them. Yeah. Um, that's not me. I, I like a little bit of, uh, or a lot of ambiguity um, a lot of um, sort of hairy things that need to be solved and disorganization that needs to kind of become uh, brought together in one way or another. Um, and I love being able to see an end game um, that maybe everybody else doesn't see and then figure out how to map back um, to the starting point, get 
get those people together and then right. sort of together move our way toward that promised land or yeah. that amazing thing that you're you're and again, like you said, it's a lot of that a lot of that problem solving and, and the minutia and and sort of finding surprise yeah. connection points and stuff is that right right and and um i would say constraints breed brilliance like you're always mm -hmm. going to run into things you didn't expect um right. all you know you don't have enough money you don't have enough time you don't you know that and so the the looking at at that as a challenge or um, i mean an opportunity really more than a challenge and, and something that hey you know and you can really uncover something that maybe you didn't think of and so i again back to my role i think you know one day we might be building a, a wireframes and a prototype for something new the next day we might be engaging deeply with customers and getting their feedback from all over the world the next day we might be really engaging with engineering on um, like our best practice around our whole product development life cycle and how do we are we doing the right thing around the way we're writing requirements and handoffs and getting product right. out the door uh, how do we want to measure success? Are we are we tracking the right KPIs, and how do we want to evolve that? Um, are, you know, so that that diversity, even you know, extending into support and feeling um, a, a huge level of empathy and engagement around um, not just not just getting something out the door, but what what happens on the day to day basis? How does it feel to be using the product, and yep. and how can we how can we make that better? Whether it's in the core technology or or surrounding pieces of it. One of the things we taught, we've really focused on on my team is something um, I started calling the softer side of security. And as a Chicagoan um, who probably maybe loves Sears somewhere in your heart, um, sure. even though it's it's gone but not forgotten. Oh, uh, we, we don't call it that other thing, right? <laughs> it's still a Sears tower. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've been I've been calling it the softer side of security. So a yeah. lot of a lot what we found in dealing um, and engagement with our customers is things. You know, it's crazy. Like I was kind of a backroom guy. I'm a techie guy. I'm not a marketer, and yet I'm finding the most challenging part of my job is engaging with my stakeholders and mm. managing change with end users. Right. And because they're paranoid that your big brother or just the complexity of You're just going to make it too hard just, for them, or yeah, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. You're going to get mm -hmm. in the way of productivity, and and right. then also explaining to uh, executive members or boards on Monday mornings, like you're spending and spending and spending, like what is enough? You know, what is, yes. how do you measure risk? And like yeah. ha helping them put some concreteness around yep. how good am I? Am I getting better or worse? How do I compare to my peers? You know, and yeah. if I'm a mid-market healthcare organization in the U.S., am I better or worse than all the other mid-market healthcare organizations in the U.S.? And so that that's something, that softer side of security that we've been focused on as well as just kind of the core Hey, stop bad stuff from coming in and yes. then fix it fast if, if something does get through. Right. And, you know, and from a from a work standpoint as well, we 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 drill this home almost every week. But there, for so many people who think that the only way to get into cybersecurity is, you know, by by coding or by pen testing or by doing this or that, like there are so many um vital important jobs that you know involve other aspects of cybersecurity whether like you say it's it's making sure that it's integrated properly or that people are comfortable with it or that stakeholders understand the scope of it and those are real those are real jobs with real important skills and real outcomes that affect things as much as you know tuning the firewall up correctly or or blue teaming or anything like that yeah. so you oh, know so, if you if you're worried yeah. about it then you know oh I'm I've been a lawyer my whole life I've been a veterinarian my whole life like there are still there are still these paths in as 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 you're basically saying here yeah I, i'm so glad you mentioned that because yeah you know, like i said i'm i'm kind of new to cybersecurity and i i'd like to think that i've I've brought a lot of value to the company that wouldn't mm -hmm. have otherwise happened. And since I've been here, I've also brought in several people, especially women who didn't necessarily have any legacy in cyber, but have are some of the most impactful, um, well-known people in the company. And and the the cool one of the most rewarding things for me, not just in at Mimecast, but my whole tech career is is kind of figuring out that magical cocktail of um, personality traits, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, you probably know about portfolio optimization and investments. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an analog to teams, you know, where yeah. you can have sort of high beta people who are kind of um, really creative and energetic and add a lot, but they're also sort of 
maybe a little bit unpredictable. And then you have some people who bring kind of this really steady execution focus and, and an ability to always kind of see things through, you know, so that that magical combination of, of talents and personalities that together really enable you to envision and, and achieve something that would otherwise never be possible with a homogeneous group or a single individual uh, is, is really the fun. And seeing, seeing that happen and seeing what that ends up meaning for, the, for those individuals in their careers, like finding their round peg, round hole and and then also um, watching teams just uh, feel good about about achieving something together um, that otherwise wouldn't have happened has really uh, just been an amazing thing for me. That's fantastic. So, uh, you know, along with or in conjunction with your work with Mimecast, uh, we, uh, you know, I learned that you have made it your life's work to help uplift and support the economic advancement of women in the, in the workplace and cybersecurity and in all aspects of work around the world. Uh, through your mentoring and educational organization, Women at Work, as well as your books, Men at Work and Fashion at Work and much more. So uh, I wanted to start by talking about your longstanding mission. How did you start helping in this way? Now, I'm sure a lot of our listeners would like to know how to get involved with solving problems that are important to them, but might not know where to start. So let's start with that question. The moment you realized that you needed to help women and girls get ahead in the world, what was the first thing you did to begin helping and where did it grow from there? Yeah, I, I went to Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and, and I was there in the late 80s, and there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, community and economic struggle during that time period, and so I started working in transitional housing facilities. I don't, you, anybody who's maybe too young won't remember this, but um, kind of the crack epidemic was in full swing, and right. there was just a lot of poverty, and so I, I, I started getting engaged then, and that, that inspired kind of the first 10, almost five, five to 10 years of my career where I was really committed to being involved in social change. And again, you know, when I started talking about community and economic development and public policy and those kinds of things. And um, so that was a real focus and dedication early on in my career. And I thought it would be a long, my, that's what I would be doing forever. And, but uh, as things, as I got out of business school and I randomly ended up in tech, I, I felt like I'd gotten away from from that, and I, I had micro level opportunities to continue doing it um, during my career in the private sector. And one of the things I realized through that is is how uh, a lot. I think early on I thought, oh, I'm kind of selling out by by going away from what I was originally doing. But realizing that that pri- the private sector is really an opportunity to be incredibly magnanimous, and there's really no better way to serve, um, serve that original mission I have than to give someone a job and, and give them an opportunity to realize a career that they would never have otherwise had and that they completely earned on their own, but they may not have ever had that opportunity to get right. their foot in the door. Um, and I've been able to do that so many times over uh, for the last you know 20 something years. And it, that, that has been so, and so fun and fulfilling. And then in my late forties, um, I suddenly started getting asked to to speak to more and more groups of women. And at first, I was like, "Why would any? Why does anybody want to hear from me?" Especially because I would get in front of these groups of women who were amazing. I mean, they they had been engineers like right out of the shoot, and right. I I frankly still felt like a complete imposter. I think everybody sort of has some level of imposter syndrome, right. but I still was. But but even though I was kind of I felt uh, just a little uncomfortable with it and. I, every time that I had the opportunity to do it and all of a sudden it was happening quite a bit, I walked away just realizing I would get all these notes and just overwhelmed with gratitude. Mm-hmm. And I, I started to think, well, maybe there is, maybe there is something, maybe there's an obligate, maybe there's an opportunity here in an obligation. Mm-hmm. And, and also, and, and the opportunity to get back to kind of what I originally had wanted to do, but in, in a way that made perfect sense for me, given how my career hit had evolved and right. and where I was at this point in my life. And so the other challenge around it was that I had really pretty much this whole time been traveling. Like I, I always had jobs where I was on the road. I wasn't, I wasn't someone who could say, oh, I can show up and volunteer or do this thing on this day. And, yep. and so real having this epiphany that, that there were these groups of women who, who I, 
we're so hungry for this kind of engagement and advice and guidance um, at a time where I realized that I could achieve kind of a publish and subscribe, like a very high scale publish and subscribe model around um, not having to be there, but to have content and to have a platform that, that connected women to each other, you know, that you didn't have to rely on your network just in your immediate in your yeah. immediate sphere, right. especially, especially if you don't for have women. One. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like yeah. so many women, you know, their parents, they're the first generation and in, or in, in their family to have the opportunity to go right. to college or, mm -hmm. or be in um, this, this kind of field, you know, a technology field. And so to be able to reach around across the world. So like when I set up that mentor matching program, you know, one of the most rewarding things was to start to see women in India ask for appointments with women in the US or vice versa, or, or mm -hmm. women in the US asking for appointments with someone I had from South Africa or right. you know, the other way around. And mm -hmm. so um, that that's really, it's it's been really interesting. I, the thing that I, as I, there's so much more I wanna do with it. So sure. I have this whole curriculum that I've written oh, okay. around, I call it the one day MBA, um, but I, I haven't launched it. And I have a third book called Babies at Work. Um, okay. <laughs> that a career girl's guide to navigating uh, pregnancy and parenting, but sure, sure. The, but it's been you know it's served its purpose so far, I, and it's just brought brought me a lot of joy, and I I hope that it's also opened um, opportunities and connections and and um, and guidance for women who wouldn't otherwise have had it. Yeah, it sounds like it has, and I, I, every 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 good act is an act that you know moves moves everything forward. So that's that's very gratifying to hear. Uh, just how mu how much you know you've you filled this need and 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 sort of inspired people. So I want to move uh, uh, sort of focus down into uh, cybersecurity. I'd love to talk to you about the work of bringing more women into the cybersecurity field. I guess first to ask what is what has been your experience as a woman working in the cybersecurity field, and what are some common policies, prejudices, or underlying and unaddressed issues in the cybersecurity field that you've seen holding other women back or caused unnecessary roadblocks for them. Yeah, well, uh, so I'll um, I'll talk about the field more broadly, but I'll mm -hmm. I'll start with just my experience at Mindcast because sure. I Please. when I when I first came in, the team that I ended up uh, bringing together, there were there were a few disparate teams that were brought together, and I, there were almost there were almost no women on it, and and I, I, it wasn't anybody's explicit decision to do that. It was just right. kind of the way things naturally evolved, and so it was. I mentioned that just because it was. It was it's, it was such a, an example of what you're saying around these these individual things that happen that have a, a domino effect or catalytic right. effect. And so as soon as as soon as I was in that role, suddenly women from inside the company who were maybe in sales, who didn't want to be any sale in sales anymore, who wanted to stay in the company, approached me and said, "Hey." I want to come, I want to come work with you, you know, but they wouldn't yeah. have had there not been a female leader in that role, they wouldn't have done that. And, and they've turned out to be just absolute rock stars. Like I can't even imagine our business without them having evolved into those roles and, right. and, and also what it meant for them and their careers. And, and then also at the same time that the outside talent that I, I've, I've been able to attract based on that. And, and, I, and I'll say, you know, um, and, and the guys that I'm talking about would, would admit this, like in the early days of me bringing in some of that, it was people who weren't that kind of died in the wool, deep domain, pro, you know, been product managers in cyber sure. for 10, 15 years. Yep. They were like, why are you using this valuable headcount that should be for another one of those guys for this, this other role? Yes. Uh, and, but then within a quarter, they were all, like, oh my God, they just couldn't believe what it did for them and our team and our ability to do, do the things that we needed to do in an extraordinary way because of, again, that cocktail or that optimized portfolio yeah, of talent. Yeah, balancing of, of sort of forces or energies or dispositions or skill sets. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess to that end, I want to ask uh, what we can do in the cybersecurity field to not only make cybersecurity careers more accessible or desirable to women, but also sort of go beyond moving roadblocks out of the way and move toward actively seeking, recruiting, encouraging a more diverse set of professionals to enter and enhance the industry in this way. Yeah, I, 
it's, a, it's, it's such a good question because it's, it's hard. Most of the, the, the actions that have happened since I've been there, like the before and after picture is so different. And, and yeah. so it's neat to see that catalytic effect to think about it being more programmatic and more widespread is, is an interesting question because I, I think part of it is back to the original point. I think it, it is a chicken and egg thing because it feeds on itself. So people, mm -hmm. if women can see themselves or, you know, or they see someone who they can see themselves in or who they'd like to, to see themselves, it, they're more apt to sort of all of a sudden imagine and, and pursue something they wouldn't otherwise do if they just are looking at a group of people that don't reflect them at all. And so, uh, you know, just an, an interesting example is I plucked um, a young woman who I knew who was a kinesiology major right out mm -hmm. of undergrad, mm -hmm. uh, which is physical therapy. Right. And she, she was kind of, I, I had known her for a long time. Her parents had, had um, were first generation immigrants in the U S and, and I just had kind of followed her and because she was very bright and, and I kept saying to her, you know, does she have a job? Does she have a job at? And I made her come in and, and interview. And even though I think she was probably like, oh, I have no interest in this. And she's ended up being, she's now two years in and just a rock star and absolutely loves it. And, wow. and so it's, I think when I think about the programmatic aspect, you know, if there's a way to, to grab people like that and early on into jobs that don't require there's always jobs in the early phases of these, you know, there's pockets of things where you just need smart people, you know, right. like eat hungry, male or female. I mean, I've hired several people right out of college in the last mm -hmm. couple of years. Almost every one of them, I think 100% of them have been unbelievable. Like, and what they have become in the organization and how they've evolved in six months, a year is just I don't know. I don't know if it's this generation or they like their ability to learn and pick things up. And, and it's literally like they've been there for 10 years. And, wow. and it's just it, that I think, you know, again, it's not necessarily gender specific, but I think if you, if you can make a concerted effort to bring interns in an undergrad and, and then just proactively because the, the, the graduation rates are, over 50% women and in, in undergraduates and not just mm -hmm. look for engineering backgrounds and those right. kinds of things. I think if you can get that early on and they're just kind of part of the ecosystem and they're learning and it becomes like a graduate degree for them in the early they're and they're, and they're, and they add a lot of value to the company because they're, they're able to, to be good arms and legs and, and pick things up and, and they may not stay in that particular role, but just making it known that, that those kinds of lateral moves that I mentioned earlier that I made are open to them. I think that's the other thing that the company can do companies can do is, is make, make those career paths, not so prescriptive, especially for those people that are coming in, in their twenties, you know, they don't, right. they just need to get started. And so they may find that they started in support, but they actually really have an amazing um, interest in, strength and in, in a lot of the work that is involved in product development, you know, or QA or right. whatever it is, um, or marketing. So, or, and vice versa. So I think if, if it's possible to almost have those kinds of programs and maybe even let people, uh, rotate around, around the company, you know, for a quarter of the time. And then at the end of it, it's almost like you had sort of a fellowship, you know, and, and, um, we had this at my last company where, it was it was a it, it it was a very programmatic way of plucking people out of undergrad and even business school. They moved around in at different parts of the organization, and uh, at the end they were you know kind of fellows, you know, and and it was something you could put on your resume. And and many of them stayed for are still at the company ten years later, and some went on to do something else, went back to school or yeah. took took a job at a different organization. Well, to to that end, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, the notion of of sort of building the bench, uh, to use a baseball term, for female cybersecurity professionals in the industry, because you know, we're, as you're saying, there's you know, there's a lot of incentive to uh, bring you know uh, uh, women and, and and diverse candidates in at intern levels or at entry levels or getting you know uh, moves into you know sort of lower level jobs. But do you have any thoughts on 
sort of diversifying the upper levels of management, C-suites, et cetera, that it seems like an even taller order in some ways. Do you have any, any strategies for female cyber professionals that uh, want to sort of promote into upper levels of, of organizations? Yeah, I, I think back to kind of how I ended up here. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at tech, cyber is probably the, one of the least gender diverse areas just because it is so techy. I think when you get into right. infrastructure tech, it becomes, the numbers get you know, more tough. Yeah. But I think tech more broadly, if you're looking across B2C and all parts of B2B enterprise, there there are a lot of amazing women who have who have risen in the ranks. You know, the last company that I was in was a, a three billion dollar, very broad ERP portfolio, and there were all kinds of women running sales engineering support. You know, for a massive organization of 15,000 employees and 100,000 customers around the world. And so there's no reason that those kinds of, that kind of talent, and there, there was amazing next level down as well, like that kind of VP, senior director, director level, there, there were almost more women that had risen in the ranks there. And, I, and I'm guessing the same has been true, like in Oracle and I, I spent a, a little bit of time in IBM. IBM have, had lots and lots of women. And so I think where there's an opportunity to look more broadly in tech to women that have risen to a certain point and then give them the opportunity in cyber, even though their domain might not be as deep, but they're, they're bringing um, lots of other amazing things from, from a broader experience in tech might be a way to do that. Yeah. Now I, I, I want to go back to, you talked a little bit about your, the mentoring uh, program through through Women at Work. Um, you have a very robust mentor to mentee matching system, uh, and as you said, it's it's global and it's a key component of the site. So, can you tell me about some success stories that you've seen involving mentors helping professional women clear institutional or cultural roadblocks and succeed? Yeah, there it it's actually been a real range. One of the things uh, to say about it, we we leveraged a, just for those of you who don't know it, um, we leveraged a. I think of it as like a marketplace, you know, and so there's mm -hmm. supply and there's demand. Right. And, and, and the way I, a lot of this was selfish on my part because I wanted to be able to mentor and help women, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't able to give a long-term commitment to anyone. And I, and I think that's true for most women. I didn't want to have to sign up for like some big mentor training or say, Hey, I'm going to meet you every Sunday or whatever it was. But I, I felt like there was a lot of value in being able to solve, to connect with someone and solve a, dis a, a discrete point in time challenge. And so that's what's, that's what it's designed to do. We use like a shopping cart uh, framework through we're platformed on Squarespace. So it's, okay. you go and you see there's an architect or there's a mm. physician or several different physicians. There's all, right. there's several people in different roles in tech. There's, um, there's all kinds of people, designers and teachers and coaches, all that stuff. So um, when you pick, when you pick someone and I've had some women come on and pick three people they want to meet with. I've had some pick one, I've had some pick five, you know? And, and so, and the, and the, the examples of things are, Hey, I have an interview next week in the, you know, this field, can you just help me dry run it? Or what are the key things that I, I should highlight out of my background or avoid? Um, so it's like a, a real tactical, pragmatic opportunity to get guidance from someone who's very objective. Um, same with, uh, hey, I, I'm out of, I've been out of the workplace for five years. Here's what I was before. Um, I think this is what I want to get back into, but I have no idea how to, how to be, you know, sort of wedge my way back in. What's sure. What's the best best way to to do that? What are my options? Um, I'm negotiating my, you know, I'm trying to negotiate a raise. Like I've been in this place for three years. I've done this. This is how would how would you go about positioning that? What's real? What's realistic? You know, what what's going to resonate with someone? So there's the, those are some of the examples. I think um, also just people feeling. I had one example of a woman, um, amazing woman who has had, she's now in her early 60s, she's the most amazing person I've ever known, um, has been a tech exec forever, mm -hmm. lived all over the world, and was a, a woman uh, in, in sales and tech with Microsoft, and uh, mainly with Microsoft, for when there were just no women, and, and right. you know, because she's in her early 60s, and so um, a young woman who, 
I've gotten to know in, in South Africa, who is one of the, the top salespeople now, and she's probably in her, in her 30s. She reached out and wanted to meet with this woman in the US. And I think part of it was about, you know, I, I've been selling for a long time, but I just, I just don't know if I want to sell for another 20 years, you know, but I want to mm-hmm. stay intact. And I want my career to grow. What are, what are my options? Um, you know, as someone who it, watching someone who is now in their sixties and, you know, right. 20 or more years down the yeah. line, who's done, who's done a couple of different things and twists and turns, you know, and, and her thoughts on that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that yeah. there, yeah, yeah, there's yeah. been a lot of yeah, really no, and, nice and stories. I think a lot of those times too, like you said, that, that feeling of, stuckness or confusion about what to do next can be answered with two or three authoritative answers from someone that you trust. And and sometimes that, that's all it takes to get unstuck is hearing the right person say, you can do this, or this is the thing you can do, or you just need to pivot in this one small way. So yeah, I can totally see the benefit. Of it that. is. It, uh, it's so true. It is amazing. But that, the thing that always amazes me is people who actually don't know the problem that well or at right. all. And at, like you're saying, just a couple of words or just one, one question phrased in a particularly right. incisive way that um, just unlocks something that you go, how do you know, how do I not think of that before? So yeah, yeah I hope, I hope it um, continues to add value. We'll see. So can we talk a little bit about your book, Men at Work, uh, and to use the book's phrase, the process of navigating male archetypes? Uh, can we talk about, I would like to know how understanding some of the hard coding of uh, male cultural assumptions within cybersecurity can, you know, if we can use that information to change the culture and make it more fertile for a diverse workforce? Yeah, well, first, I just wanted to give a little background on how, how it started. You know, I was Please. mentioning earlier, my late 40s, where I was all suddenly getting asked to speak more and more to groups of women. And I, I have um, a, 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 a colleague from Oracle, who I'm who's still my closest friend. And, and he's, he's 10 years my junior, but he's, so wise and he's always he's ended up serving as as this amazing kind of career and life coach for me on the side he's one of those people that shows up with that incisive question that right. just gets right at it and he doesn't yep. he doesn't let me get away with anything you know so I can always call him and know that he's going to give it to me straight and so a- around the time that I was I was telling him about how much joy I was getting out of out of this unexpected engagement he said you know I, I really think that you've become too one dimensional and you need, you need to do something else. You need to pursue something else in your life, make your life bigger beyond work. And, and I've always thought that you should write a book and um, you should write a book. So I, he, he called me the next day and he said, what's your book about? And I told him what I thought it was. He said, no, nah, no, nah, it's not about that. You, you need to write a book about how you've been successful because you have figured out how to, how to drive really productive connections with men in a way that a lot of women struggle with Mm -hmm. and that there's real opportunity in that. And that, that certainly isn't your only factor of why you've been successful or how you've been successful, but that's, that's having watched me. He said, I, as an outsider, I I believe that that is like your superpower and that's what's really helped, helped you, um, evolve your career in a way that many people don't. And so, um, I went away and, and I, I, I had always heard about the, the seven stories that get repeated over and over again. I don't know. And people often attribute it to Shakespeare, but it's not, but I get, it's attributed to all kinds of different people, but, but it's basically like you can somehow boil down every possible plot, like book or play or movie into one of these seven stories. And so, I, I kind of liked that idea. And I, I realized that throughout my career, there was so many times that we'd say, oh, he's the new John Smith or, yeah. or, you know, he's the new whatever. And, and you start to see there's some danger in over generalizing and stereotyping, yep. but there's also, there's, there's, it's sort of human nature to be able to, to try to categorize. Yep. So and to give you people a shorthand. Yeah. Yeah. And to, mm-hmm. and to also like, just to understand, um, someone and where they're right. coming from and what, what are the th- what makes them tick and how they're motivated. And, I, you know, I think part of it came to, from me early on actually being quite terrible at, at doing this. And I remember mm. coming home and being fr- like really knowing I was right on something and going head to head with a, a very, 
uh, hard headed sales, uh, very loud and um, alpha dogish sales leader, yeah. and be and telling my husband about how frustrated I was with it. He said, "You." you are overthinking us. Like you, you know, we are very simple people (laughs) as men. And, um, and, and so I think that, that epiphany point and realizing that it wasn't one and what wasn't enough to be right. Right. And that, and that kind of taking the time to figure out how these guys were wired and what made them tick and then how I could be more successful given that, Right. wasn't a bad thing like that that wasn't necessarily selling out or that was just part of you know being effective being executive okay. becoming a leader you know was was being able to um be more thoughtful about all of that and as i st- as i i felt like too as i started I, I that i had stories to tell like that that um you know for each of these types you know there there was there was a story to tell that would bring it to life and um, to be honest with you, it was it was kind of funny because I, I when I I sort of forced you know you saw for X I was like it has to be seven like the seven stories it has to be seven right. so I, I kind of came I, I kind of cranked out what the first seven were that came to mind thinking that that wouldn't stand the test of time but it it pretty it seems to have so far I'm okay. sure there I'm sure there is an eighth type I'm sure that there are lots right. of people who are multiple types but um, sure. But it's uh, it's been fun. I just I actually just gave a keynote on it. Uh, I hadn't done that in a while, and it was it, it's always really interesting. Um, it's a great way to get conversation going. And and I usually the first question one of the first questions I always get are when are you going to write the about the 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 women types? And and I right. it would it is an interesting thought, but I I'm going to stay away from that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, I want to, in your bio, you noted, and we already talked about it a little bit, but you've, you've uh, been involved in programs that help women find uh, transitional housing and, and help get back on their feet. And so I want to talk about the hindrances to work across the board, specifically here in cybersecurity, of course, that come from uh, material issues such as housing instability or toxic home life or other massive disruptors that many of us thankfully never have to deal with. In working to hire more diverse candidates and more women in the industry, how does one factor in these difficulties and maybe even build them into the creation of jobs for people being held back in this way? Yeah, it, I just read some stat. I'm sure you've seen it too. Like just during the pandemic, not just in cyber, but how women have been particularly hard hit. I think yes. and let left the workforce. And I saw something right. like over over two million. And massive. Um, yeah, massive. Th- yeah, it's just it's so heartbreaking for me. I, I, that was really one of the main reasons I started Women at Work. There were kind of two things. One was to help women figure out how to stay in the game during those difficult, you know, years when you're really trying to have a family and 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 kind of right. hopefully not just quit entirely and figure out how to do that in a way that works for you. And the second was to maximize your economic opportunity. You know, how do you how do you play your career in a way that um, gives you the most financially as, as possible um, around negotiating your salary and making different moves? And um, because that that gives you a lot of power. And so it it is on the transitional housing front and 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 the barriers. You know, it's I, I've seen. I've seen Mimecast do a lot of really amazing things during the pandemic and, and even more broadly to really help women stay in the game, whether it's um, helping them navigate daycare, you know, I think especially because it, I, I can't even, my husband works as well. I, I cannot, we said so many times in the first six to nine months of COVID, I, my boys are now teenagers, but right. if I had if they were under 10, I, oh, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know what we would have done. It, you know, it just would have been so chaotic. And, um, but I do think there are, it can just seem so overwhelming. So to the extent that employers can really think about flexible work, can think about, um, daycare support, can think about, um, you know, helping women transition into different roles during, during times in their life that, help accommodate what they need, but you don't lose them. So even though they may feel like they're taking a step back, like I did I mentioned earlier, or they're yeah. treading water, it is so much easier. You're still at least you're adding value. You're staying current. You're, you know, it's, and it's in your whole scheme of your career, it's actually a relatively short time span. And, and, it, and as soon as you want it, what I found in my, in my situation and, and women like me who've, who've kind of followed a similar thing and been able to hang on 
you know, even if it's in a form that's a little ugly for, or, you know, messy for a little while, it's, it, it's, you completely end up back to where you should have been. Like I thought I would be behind forever, but I was immediately, I mean, within a year or two able to be exactly where I would, it would have been had I never, had oh. I never had to do that. And I, I've seen that with other women as well. And so that's, that's really heartening, I think, to realize that it's worth it's worth kind of figuring out both on the employer side and the employee side how to how to how to wig, you know, sort of make it through that like that part in in your road that's just you're so squeezed and you may feel like it's not worth it to spend all the money on daycare and the pain, you know, of yeah. of commuting and all of those things. But um, I think if you can just really part and if organizations programmatically can partner with with their female employees to feel like that's part of being a good employer and that it pay, it will pay off um you know i think we'll end up in a better place i don't know if that answers your question but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, this has been great. And I, I just, as we wrap up today, um, feel free, tell me a bit more about Mimecast. What are some project services or initiatives uh, that you're working on for 2021 that you're particularly excited about at the moment? Yeah, Mimecast is such an amazing company. Uh, I, 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 the, our founder uh, and CEO, Peter Bauer, is is really one of the most extraordinary people I've, I've gotten to know just as as a mind in cybersecurity, but also just as a person and the way that he run, has built the company, the way he runs it, the way he, how thoughtful he is about our customers. I've never, I've never been able to work for an enterprise software company that cared about its employees and customers at, as deeply and genuinely right. as, as we do. And that really is, is a standard set from him and, and really permeates everything we do. Um, beyond that, like the backdrop of, of cyber and, and what we've all seen unfolding over the last, I mean, it, it's a, an incredibly dynamic and, and difficult space to be in, but it's especially, it's been very much so, uh, or more so, I guess, over the last six months. Sure. And so that, that opportunity to help to really dig in to achieve um, the next level of sophistication and solving the problem, the way it needs to be solved now, not the way it was solved a year ago or two years ago is, is really quite exciting. Um, and, and to feel like we're in a position based on some really wise decisions that were made about our technology footprint and um, the way that our platform works around an interconnected global grid that enable us to evolve very quickly um, to, to solve the, the ever-changing problem in, in the way that it needs to be solved. Uh, and so part of that is is overcoming the complexity that has kind of ensued around those, and you know, I was talking about those those uh, micro categories, you know, right. of of best of breed tech, and right. and seeing the opportunity to blur those lines to create stronger efficacy, to create kind of a a, a stronger scale publish and subscribe model that mm. that mm -hmm. thinks that thinks about not just email but the this this explosion of, of communication channels and collaboration channels with teams and onedrive and slack and all of these things oh, yeah. that you know in instantaneously you can be uh, taking something whether it's a bad url or attachment or whatever it is and it can just so quickly traverse across everything you have on your own my own life, but then, you know, across the entire organization or, you know, into our supply chain. So, um, so that's, that's what I'm excited about because it, it's, um, it's another Tetris um, yes. that take us, take us full circle. Back, Absolutely. Um, the ever, ever changing Tetris that we get to love it. We get to solve. So one, one last question, the most important of all, if our listeners want to learn more about Christina Van Houten, Mimecast or women at work, where can they go online? So uh, I, my site is uh, womenatwork.com, W-O-M-E-N-A-T-W-O-R-K.com. Uh, mm -hmm. And Mindcast, just reach out to us anytime, uh, mindcast.com, you can find me. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly on LinkedIn if you'd like, or I'm always here for, I love um, the opportunity to, to give advice to women that are looking to get into cyber or tech or, or other things that they might be facing. Um, it's, it's nice to be a wise old lady at this point and be, be able to focus on giving back uh, as opposed to always just trying to figure out how I was yeah. going to make my own way. So um, 
excited for the opportunity to do that more. Awesome. Christina, thank you so much for your time and insights today. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it too. Uh, as always, thank you to everyone at home for work uh, or work for listening and watching. New episodes of the Cyberwork podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page or at infoseconds2.com slash podcast or on audio wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. And uh, don't forget to check out our hands-on training series, Cyberwork Applied. Tune in as expert InfoSec instructors teach you a new cybersecurity skill and show you how that skill applies to real-world scenarios. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash learn to stay up to date on all things cyber work. Thank you once again to Christina Van Houten, and thank you all again for watching and listening. We'll speak to you next week. Ciao. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.